You are listening to the Overfunctioning Leadership Podcast, learning leadership concepts through life experience. Welcome, friends, to another Overfunctioning Leadership Podcast. I'm Alex. I'm John. And I'm Zach. And we are glad to have you listen to us today on this January podcast. Uh, we are going to be talking about emotional triangles today, not just regular triangles like equilateral or obtuse, right? What's the third not one? Not geometrical. Acute. We are not talking about, yeah, cute. <laughs> my least Those favorite subject. Yeah. Geometry. I was awful at it. Which I've never taken in my entire life. What? Never taken a geometry class. I went to Mogador High School. So. Oh, okay. Oh, so high <laughs> teaching <enough> standards? <laughs> I'll Are you allowed you to say that as a teacher? I'll let you judge for I, yourself. I know it's not fable section, but definitely had a kid in my geometry class at one point hit himself in the corner with a whole bunch of boxes over top of himself. The entire class period, the teacher didn't know he was there. <laughs> Anyways, he, he actually disconnected himself from the emotional triangle. I can see that. <laughs> Anywho, um, so before we get into the wonderfulness that is emotional triangles, which is a foundational piece to... The leadership development that we talk about and all that goodness. Uh, we need to recap what we've been doing in the last couple podcasts. So, last time we did a, for the overfunctioning leadership podcast, it was about leading the wounded. So, gentlemen, what was that about? Well, uh, speaking as the, I felt like the observer. Um, you know, it, it just got really raw. And we're not talking WWE here. It just got raw with you talking about the loss of your sister and John about his mother and just the way that the holidays affect our memories and our behaviors um, as a result of their death and just sort of getting over that. Um, and you don't really get over something like that, but controlling the way in which it changes you, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, just having a different, your response to the emotional triggers would change. At least yeah. that's what I've a discovered. Lot of, How, a lot of reactivity. Yeah, 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 yeah. So changing from reactivity to response um, as best you can. I, I have something to add. I, I don't think that I shared this the last time, but I did talk about my mom's passing. And I, I teach a leadership class with students, and we had our last um, our, our last class. <laughs> we had our last class uh, last week, and the students uh, had a card, and they filled out any questions. I said, you can ask me any questions you want. And one particular question was, Knowing what you know now with Bowen theory, how would you have behaved differently in your own family as a kid? And hmm. when I read that question, I like lost it. Oh, really? I really just like I had to, I had to stop and pause for it seemed like a long time. It may have been a minute of just really just trying to gather myself. And and I shared with them that um, I I wish I would have been more curious about my mom and just the challenges that mm. she had as a person. And, um, you know, I, I didn't love her well, I don't think, near the end of her life. And I wish I would have done something different. But it was what was really interesting to me was when I read that question on the card, how right away I just got really emotional and, uh, you know, in front of a group of students, but it just that's just what happened and it was just it was very interesting to me how quickly it came to the surface just with that one question on the card anyways is it something you were thinking about or is no. it because of our discussion or no, I, I hmm. don't know I, I guess I think about it you know when I think <clears throat> about Bowen theory and I think about um, being curious about people and and maybe this is an example in my own family where I could have used that well with someone who was important to me and I did not. Hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what, what I haven't really, I don't know, but hmm. I just, what happened? So gotcha. lots to think on. Yeah. And you're just lacing in with another fable when it's not even fable time. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help myself. <laughs> and so since then, the episode after that mm -hmm. was 
the next Zammer. Yes, it was. And we did Star Wars The Last Jedi, which is full of spoilers and leadership theory throughout. And John, I don't think you've seen the movie, although I believe last time you talked about the last movie you saw in the theaters was like Apollo 13. Apollo 13. It was, <laughs> it was so good. I didn't want to, I just don't want to see another movie because it may spoil just the pinnacle. Uh, cinematic experience that was for me. So part of me wants to tell the spoilers, but to save you and from uh, some of our other listeners about, you know, Star Wars, maybe we should not talk about the spoilers of that. Mm. Anyway, Zach and I watched it. Um, we had varying responses to it, and it was it was a wild ride. And <laughs> you'll have to listen to our Zammer, our Zach and Alex movie uh-huh. review, just to. Just to hear our thoughts on it. Yeah, and, and an interesting uh, review as well from Priscilla. Came yeah. up with something a little bit different this time, yeah. so that was nice. And if you watch the YouTube of it, John, which we know you and all of our listeners will, they'll see that she had an interesting apparel choice as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. She was wearing a Yoda backpack as a hat, so that's a must-see. Yeah, it's must-see. Mm-hmm. So um, with that, we're going to go into Fable Time, so we can go ahead and toss another log on the Yule Time fire. And... <laughs> With that, though, we're actually going to talk about the sexual harassment discussion that's been circulating around Hollywood mostly, but also in the in the political realm now as well. Uh, this bubbled up to the surface. And so, Zach, can you kind of give us an idea of what that looks like with, to our audience? Yeah, so if you're listening to this as it's being released, like you know what we're talking about, but if we're speaking to you from the past, hello, future, uh, this is just another one of those things that's making a media circuit. And I think in large part for good reason, because it's bringing up a conversation about sexual harassment and assault is the big thing that's being talked about, sexual assault. But within workplaces, that is... um, increasingly being portrayed as known about within the immediate community. So Hmm. when we're talking Hollywood, it's on the movie set or it's with regards to the studio executives abusing their power or – and we're hearing just talks of um, sexual harassment. We find out years later, you know, this is what we're hearing. Years years ago, I was – this happened or that happened by this person Mm – And I know as a listener, right, as a reader, a a purveyor of the news, uh, I have no claim to know the factuality of this, yet it's deeply influencing, not really at all because I'm sort of becoming numb to it, but it's influencing the way that I'm perceiving these people. It's affecting their jobs. A lot of people are being fired over Mm -hmm. these, are being let go from – their studio contracts. And, and a lot of it, too, especially within the, the realm that we're talking about, is usually of younger women being uh, assaulted by older men. From a lot of the stuff that I've read so far, it's usually, a, a, you know, in Hollywood, it's a younger woman with an older man as a lead actor or something, doing something inappropriate or touching or groping or anything like that. And so... What kind of levity, I mean, within the leadership realm, um, when it comes to emotional process and all the stuff that we talk about, John, do you have any thoughts about where to lead us next or Zach or, you know, when it comes to this leadership development stuff and self-differentiation and how, how's this whole emotional process working, do you think, as you look at this situation or this system? I, I do want to say I, I have seen what I feel like are two at least two distinct separate cases where you see someone who is young and making bad decisions, um, not justifiable, but you, you hear, you're you hearing about celebs who were at, in the past, celebs now in the past, you know, doing things to people. Um, and that's, that's one set of issues. But I, I feel like we're predominantly seeing as you were talking about older men and younger women, people who are in positions of influence, which is one of the ways that we define leadership. It's Mm -hmm. your ability to influence people. We're seeing these people who are in um, high places, positions of influence. Um, They're making decisions. They're people who have lots of acclaim. And we're finding out that they were doing these things. And it's interesting because I feel as if a large part of this issue, um, especially the bigger cases like Harvey Weinstein, is... 
the it's not that this was unknown to people. It's not like Harvey Weinstein and the victims were the only ones who knew about this, right? Um, as news continues to roll out, right, it's just that these allegations were known and are corroborated now, allegedly, by other sources, and a blind eye was turned. So I think about in economics, so this is maybe a totally different way of viewing it, but this is a perspective to consider. In economics, there's a principle known as game theory. And uh, for the listeners that aren't familiar with game theory, I think we could agree that having less sexual harassment or having no sexual harassment would be the preferred outcome. Yet, when a, we'll take the typical case, when an older gentleman that has a position of power uses that power in ways that are incorrect, it would be best if the entire female establishment would rise up and say, hmm. that's not acceptable. But there's, for one person to step out and say, this happened, or to report this person, is risky, was risky, is risky, because they, their own career could be stalled, they could be said that they're making it up. And so each individual woman has a, an incentive to be silent for fear of their career being hindered. And so no one says anything because the individual risk is um, too great. And so in game theory, uh, each person has an individual incentive to cheat and not report, mm. if you will. Okay. Uh, whereas if we all collectively, when I say we and the female, uh, speaking for the females, if we would all come together, which is what you see happening now, then society is then better off. But uh, I, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds of game theory for those <laughs> who don't understand it. But um, it's just the idea that each person individual has an incentive not to come forward because of fear of individual cost. And so it, it pervades. So that's one reason that I think it continued for so long without anyone speaking up or not very many people speaking up. So that's my muddled thoughts on game theory and sexual harassment. Hmm. Well, I think that pretty, I mean, the only other piece that I was thinking at it is homeostasis. I mean, if the homeostasis is that this is usually what happens and this is the norm, then breaking out of that norm and breaking that homeostasis is going to cause the system want to go back to the way it used, things used to be. And especially if this person who, in my mind, um, they're influencing the system, so they're a leader, but not the type of leader that obviously that is appropriate here and maybe more of an, a positional leader than an actual leader because of the things they were doing. But still, regardless, they set the homeostasis, and the homeostasis says this is the way things used to be, and this is the way things are. And so if somebody's going to step out, that would make things very, very difficult for them. Losing career, and there's way too much. The, the cost of it is way more than the benefit of it. So, okay, cool. Um, just thought we'd be... Um, Topical on you know on point here what's going on so yeah just trying to be a little relevant and look at things through the lens of leadership yeah so um, which is going to lead us to emotional triangles um, emotional triangles is one of the bedrocks of Bowen systems theory and family systems theory and leadership development and but before we get even into emotional triangles Zach could you talk about maybe like emotional process first and self differentiation and then lead us into emotional triangles yeah so we've talked in the past about self differentiation and uh, one of the main tenets of Bowen's theory is that we are looking at families as emotional units. And so as a part of families, because this is where bone systems theory developed, right? We are emotional beings and we have the opportunity to react rather than respond. We have the opportunity to um, do automatic functioning um, to what's happening around us rather than a 
um, sort of conscious thinking about what we're planning on doing. Mm -hmm. And so we are dealing with emotional processes in all of our relationships around us, and they influence us deeply. And that's from like a biological, this is automatic... Biological, sociological, psychological, subconscious, yeah, all there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so from that, we have self differentiation, which is your ability to remain a self, right? Your mili- ability to define yourself despite the influence of others around you. So when, um, and one of the examples in a paper I read recently on triangles, it basically says that family is the place where this starts where you have the opportunity to test your self-definition in a place that is relatively Hmm. safe and stable. That is to say, with the people around you, Hmm. I will act like that. I will behave in this way, and I won't behave in this way. John, I'm seeing some facial expressions. (laughs) What you thinking? What you just spoke of about going back into your family of origin. So tr- so we learn relating patterns and relating styles in our family of origin. And I was having a conversation just today with an individual about a challenge that they're having in relationships. And I didn't go this far yet with this person because we've just met a few times. But something to consider is what you just spoke of, of going into a particularly difficult relationship where I learned triangles or I learned reactivity and going back into that relationship and trying to behave a little different as opposed to just trying to learn a technique of some kind. Mm, yeah. You know, a lot of times we want to learn technique, but but I think where real change can happen is going back into that challenging relationship and making some just some subtle changes. Mm -hmm. I think it's something to consider. And I thought it was interesting what you said, which (laughs) it's when you said like it's easier. Did you say easier? I feel like you said it was easier or maybe less risky Uh, or. Yeah. And let me flush that out for a hot second. Yeah. So what you said, just just so we're clear, you were talking about how to like try out these different things. Right. And you said with, with your, family, your immediate family, and how that's a better testing ground? Could maybe you explain that out, flesh that yeah. out a little bit? Um, I'm assuming a lot in that little bit that I said, but when I think of family, and one of the reasons that family of origin is so significant is that those are the relationships in your life that you can never truly get rid of. You will always have a father. You will always have a mother. You will always have siblings. And so while you might be in a season of life where you might have a certain friend group that's very significant to you or, um, you know, you might have a roommate or something, like life changes and we've all experienced that. But those are the relationships that you always come back to. Those are the people who you were raised by. They were the people who taught you how to function. And ideally... Those were self-differentiated people who are showing you a way to think and to live and to be amongst other people. Um, And so when I say it's a great way to test out your self-identity, right, it's a great way to say, hey, mom, like, you believe this. Why do you believe that? And then maybe go to college and come back and say, hey, mom, I don't believe that anymore. Huh. And she's like, okay, like, well, what about this, this, and this? And in that testing, the anxiety that's created in that and the pressures from that original family, you can choose to stand firm or not, but it's not like your relationship title per se. It's not like I'm going to get fired from my job for deciding I'm a nudist. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't want to open this this can of worms, although it would be fun maybe for another time. But there's even, and John, I mean, we've talked about this a lot in the last couple weeks of even how let's say that you aren't maybe as close to your family currently. And so let's say you have a family group, or like, sorry, a, a friend group. What ends up happening is you start to to um, project those different family roles and that system and that anxiety onto your new friend group. And so people start making those different roles of their own immediate families into that friend group. And so it becomes another 
a copy, almost a copycat system of the immediate family. <laughs> so like, you start placing people in roles based off mm. of like, oh, my mom acts like this, so I have my friend who acts like this, or my dad. You know what I mean? So you start filling in. I those know roles. on my freshman hall we had my friend Mathen, and Mathen was my mother. Mathen made sure I got to bed. He <laughs> called me a dummy when I needed to, you know, make sure. I, he asked me why I wasn't doing my homework. You know, he was just a beautiful gem with stinky feet. <laughs> Unrelated. Okay, Shout so out to well, Mathen. so yes, thank you, Mathen, for your smelly feet. Um, all that to be said, emotional triangles, gentlemen. Um, what are they? So, John, help us out. What is emotional triangle? I haven't taken geometry. I think I said that before. Is that correct? <laughs> that is true. We have heard twice now. All right, twice. Now. Magador, I know you're real proud. <laughs> But but I can uh, I can draw a triangle and so in a two person relationship between in a family in another system workplace there is a tension between individuality and togetherness and so two people roommates for example you know might be college roommates could be friends could be family members they're gonna be there's gonna be tension between those two polar opposites of individuality and togetherness. Mm -hmm. And when anxiety gets high enough, that anxiety can no longer be contained in that dyad. And so a third person is triangled in to... So I'm having a complaint with Fred, and so Fred and I aren't getting along, and so I go and I find Ned, and I talk to Ned about Fred. And I said, what? Fred said to Ned. <laughs> and then you have a triangle. Or even two people can turn into an issue as well as a triangle or a dog or a cat or yeah. you know, video games a, or a whatever. The common one we see in the education setting is uh, two people, parent, child, and homework. And triangles are very interesting to almost, I would say virtually every, for the listeners out there, every dilemma that you have right now that you can't figure out or navigate your way through is a triangle. And learning how to navigate triangle, triangles successfully can be really, really helpful. And one of the things that when I was learning this and as I was reviewing it, triangles are very simple from a, a systems theory standpoint, but they're also very complex. Um, the reason they're so significant is as the smallest stable um, – relationship system, that's what things flow out of. Um, and that is to say, when you have two people, as you were saying, John, when you have two people, you're going to bring a third in. Well, one of the things that I always go back to when I think about triangles is Orson Scott Card's writing of Speaker for the Dead. And in his preface to the book, he talks about how difficult it was to write the book because it was him writing his main character entering this community, actually a small com family community of five or six people, and the thing that made it difficult to write about was you're not writing seven characters. You're writing each character in each other grouping of characters. So Fred and Ned, right, behave the way that they do, but the second you bring Jed into it, <laughs> Right, there's going to be the them as a group of three is going to act differently than any group of two, and so Jed is going to act differently with just Ned than he would with Ned and mm -hmm. Fred, and so with so many Eds in this, it's very confusing. Uh -huh. But that is to say, the complexity of this rises dramatically when you think about it. The way that I relate to Alex and the way that I relate to John is very different than the way that we all relate together. And when anxiety is in it, you're going to see shifting. And that, that's what you have to train yourself to look for. Mm -hmm. And anxiety, anxiety offloading. That's basically what, when you're talking about shifting yeah. in some ways. It's, you know, um, I can think about this week. <laughs> we had a crazy week at school with prepping for spirit week and all this craziness. And it was 
I could see myself doing it where I got like a little bit of negative talk from somebody about something I did that was like ridiculous. Like something where I was like, oh my, are you really talking to me about this? And I wanted so bad to take it back to the other advisor I work with for student council. I wanted so bad to tell her about it. And it leaked out a couple times I'm talking about because it was like, now I now I can make this little triangle about this person, and you know I mean I can offload this anxiety. You're gonna get having someone on your side. Yeah, you know? yeah, but it doesn't even like in the end it didn't do anything really other than like negative self talk, uh, negative talk about this other person. Now I think it's also important here though because we're gonna talk a lot of negative things about this, but I think it's important to talk about triangles that are just they are what they are, and it's not gonna be necessarily a negative thing. Um, so emotional triangles can be very good things as well. And so I, I don't want us to put like out this thing where we're, like, we're only talking about it in negative ways. Um, but it's natural, and that's how things work within the, the psychological realm that we live in. And regardless of which culture you're part of, and that's why we do enjoy this leadership development and this Bowen Systems Theory, because it's cross-cultural. All this, People have anxiety everywhere you go. Um, but especially in triangles, they're naturally going to form... Uh, and that doesn't mean it's going to be a bad thing um, or a good thing. It could be neutral as well. So I, I just want to make sure that we preface that by saying that it's not going to always be negative. Um, yeah. And by not being a negative, just a final final period on that. When uh, John loves to say that triangles are inherently um, relating to anxiety, like that's how they form. Yep. Um, and the thing that makes it not negative is this whole concept of self-differentiation. Your issue with a triangle primarily is the in larger systems where you see a bleed off of anxiety into other triangles. When as a smallest unit of within a system that's stable, when that can't handle it, you're going to see triangles form off into that. And hopefully we'll talk about that as we continue. Yeah. So I think we've nailed a lot of, you know, um, how do they form? Anxietal. I mean, these are anxietal form formations, and that's what they're going to form from um, in, in various different ways, but even in just natural ways, because once again, like anxiety is not always a bad thing, right? I mean, we're, I think we always talk about it and maybe in a negative light, but these, this is a natural human process to have anxiety. Right now I have anxiety between Zach, Zach and John. And it just, it is, it's just there. And so, but the way that I react to it, the way that I actually not react to it, the way that I respond to it um, can change. And so I don't drive my own anxiety up because of the anxiety I'm having between John because he's staring at me right now. Um, <laughs> Anyways, um, okay, so how they operate, I believe we also talked about a little bit here too. Um, so uh, one thing that I always find interesting with triangles, John, is that, you know, let's say that there's a triangle between the three of us. So Zach, Alex, John, and there's something called distancing. And so maybe you could talk about how, let's say that like there's an issue between Zach and I or something, or, you know, maybe you could talk about how relationships within a triangle, some people getting closer and how that distance is the third person. And maybe give a little example of that. That would be helpful too. I've used this example before of insiders and outsiders. So triangles can be helpful to think about inside and outside. So in a triangle that's not equal, uh, what's that triangle called? It an unequal triangle. It could be like, obtuse or acute. Acute or isosceles. Oh, no, isosceles is equal. Isosceles. Oh, sorry. No, equilateral is equal. <laughs> isosceles has the two S's. That's how I remember. Oh, okay. well, yeah. regardless. Okay. So let's take uh, Ted, Ed, and Ned, mm. as we talked about earlier. And let's say Ted and Ed are friends and they focus on a third, that's Ned, and they talk about Ned in maybe negative ways. So between Ted and Ed, they're the two insiders, and they create somewhat of a what's called pseudo-intimacy by focusing on Ned mm -hmm. and Ned's shortcomings. And an example that I've observed from history is in the South, where uh, white Southerners, certainly there was tension um, and competition between white Southerners on issues of um, uh, what they owned and property and 
status and so on and so forth. And so focusing on uh, African Americans, on blacks and the shortcomings, the perceived shortcomings they had in some ways was a useful strategy in the sense that it allowed for pseudo intimacy with whites focusing on the shortcomings of of slaves or ex-slaves and so I, I think triangles and racism are an interesting hmm. examination of how it helps to perpetuate racism because it actually provides a focal point for people to focus on an outsider and when you talk about eradicating racism, would we all not be better off eradicating racism? That same question is, would we not all be better off eradicating sexual harassment? But this goes back to homeostasis and how, in one sense, the triangle example and racism was useful in our history in the sense that it, it avoided the, the real difficult conversations between the two insiders by focusing on an outsider. Yeah, it's almost like, um, as, as you were talking about that, it's like I'm part of this team now. A lot of teams work that way. We're all working towards one goal. Mm -hmm. Whether the goal, goal's good or not, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, a part of... And it provides that, you know, I, the, the term is pseudo-intimacy. Pseudo and, and so we don't have to really talk about yeah. the... And so triangles, when you talk about <clears throat> insiders and outsiders... The two insiders never have to really deal with the issue that they have, the tension they have. They just focus on the outsider, and they get stuck in those positions of two insiders and an outsider. Hmm. Yeah. The other example that I, I always like, too, as a fixer, and this is just the way I always think, is um, so John John and Zach are, are having a difficult time, and they're arguing with each other a lot. And as, I, as I'm the fixer, I'm like, well, i got to get in here, and I'm going to try to bring these people together. As I do that, I might get closer to John, I might get closer to Zach, but they're most likely going to be pulled further and further away from each other because of my instigating and getting in there and trying to get them to do what I want them to do instead of allowing, allowing them to try to work out with each other and guiding them towards that. Otherwise, I'll get stuff I don't want to hear about Zach from John. I'll get stuff from Zach about John I don't want to hear about, and they're, you know, offloading their anxiety on me. And it's not really helping the situation. I'm getting closer to them, but they're not getting closer to each other. And so that's a classic example of, you know, me trying to fix some relationship between two people too. So, um, so I think the overall question here is. How do you navigate a uh, triangle when you're in it, or what do you do when you find yourself in within a triangle? Well, this is a throwback to the beginning of this podcast. We talked about emotional processes, and I think the very first thing, we talk about this with self-differentiation, we talk about this with um, when you're dealing with anxiety as a whole, and triangles are just a specific instance where you're looking at a three-person system, you take a step back and you observe the emotional processes that are happening. So that is to say, um, I would step back from John and Alex and I would say, what are they doing that is provoking a response from me that I'm not even thinking about? Hmm. And how would I rather respond? And a large part of counseling and therapy that we see is, if it's good counseling and therapy, <laughs> uh, is they're asking questions to reveal these emotional processes to you. Because in this example where you're talking about being a fixer, uh, the two people that you're trying to draw closer together are never going to be drawn closer together until they realize the ways that they're responding automatically that are pulling them apart. They're never going to realize, hey, if I keep talking bad to Alex, right, I, it's never going to fix anything between me and this other person. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, what do we do? You find yourself in a triangle. How can I apply this? I think you relate uh, separately, equally, and openly to the other two, in this case, if there are three people. Uh, try to have a separate, equal, and open relationship with each of the each of the other two people uh, on as an individual and um, you know, not try to solve things that aren't your problem. So oftentimes leaders find themselves in the middle of a triangle where uh, person A comes to them complaining about person B 
and not trying, as you said earlier, to solve the problem between mm-hmm. person A and person B. I think you can be a resource by trying to draw out facts and see what's going on and try to help calm the system down a little bit. And that helps with better thinking on both parts. Uh, but I don't think that one, well, you can do what you want. <laughs> I would recommend not trying to solve that problem for others because Ed Friedman in his book, Failure of Nerves, says that stress, he believes, is worrying about problems that actually belong to somebody else. And a squabble between two people, one has to ask themselves, is this really my problem to solve? Yeah, most definitely. Well, to recap here, let's let's go over these questions again. Uh, what uh, what are they? Emotional triangles, bred out of anxiety. We have anxiety between two people, and there's going to be an offload of anxiety to a third person or a different item. Or one of my favorites is just a quick example: is okay, two parents have a kid, kid moves out of to college. What are we going to do? It's just the two of us. Let's buy a dog. That's our new triangle. <laughs> That's a quick example of kind of a fun, more fun triangle. Um, or me and Zach are friends, and uh, what are we going to do? We buy a video game, and so the video game becomes a triangle or whatever. So um, that they are forming out of anxiety. And then how they operate. How do they operate? What are we talking about here? Well, uh, in anxious situations, as we talked about, you get insiders and outsiders formed. When it's mild or moderate, what you end up seeing is you end up seeing um, two people who are comfortable being close to someone and a comfortable outsider, maybe because they're unaware. And so that in gossip specifically, you have two people who feel close to one another because they can talk about a third. As we talked about gossiping, the issue with that is, of course... One and two gossiping about three. Well, two and three can start gossiping about one any time. So it's an inherently anxious triangle. Yeah. And, and I think the level of differentiation among the three in the triangle, mm. the more undifferentiated the people are as a collective group, the more likely they are to spawn other triangles uh, called interlocking triangles. And so now we we actually triangle in you know, the authorities or... You know, in education, we talk about going to the principal, I'm going straight to the school board, <laughs> and I'm CCing the superintendent, and, you know, that is so much anxiety that, that we have to find others that will help carry some of the burden. It's like Charlotte's Web. It's like Charlotte's <laughs> Web. Yes. Just getting all the anxiety just stuck to this giant web of triangles you decided to make. Hmm, yummy. And then you gobble them up like a spider. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, <laughs> then what do you do when you're in them? Become more self-differentiated. Take a climb up the tree. Take a look at what's going on with the situation uh, emotionally in a process, and try to figure out how you're going to respond instead of reacting to it and not being hard on yourself or on other people when you start realizing what's going on with these triangles and trying to figure out how you navigate and make more. Okay, I have some anxiety between John and I. Maybe him and I need to talk about this, and I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to bring Zach in on this. Those types of things. So. Thank you for listening to our Instructables Ask Jeeves How to <laughs> Emotional Triangles <laughs> podcast. This has been the do-it-yourself Bowen's theory <laughs> focusing on triangling. <laughs> yeah, so um, that actually, it's interesting because I think that's going to be our last almost like instructional podcast we're going to do, pretty much. We've, we've done several of them, and that is going to be uh, perhaps our last one. So I think we've covered the fundamentals of Bowen's theory, at least from an astronomical perspective. Yes. <laughs> we're going to tuck them in. We're going to say goodnight. So with that, we're actually going to close out, and you can catch us on the emails at theofpodcast at gmail.com. That's theofpodcast um, at gmail. And can I ask you a quick question? Yes. How many emails have we received? No, um, I get a lot from YouTube and from Simplecast saying that we've got our podcast up. Great. It's really nice, yeah. But others could write to they us. They could write to us. That would be fantastic. Situ- we're going to get a lot more situational stuff. Actually, our next podcast is going to be about bullying, which is I'm like super pumped about. And so, I mean, for example, we did the stuff about leading the wounded. Mm-hmm. And before that, we talked about, I'm blanking out right now, um, 
holidays, dealing with stress oh, during yeah. the holidays. Yeah, yeah. Those are the types of things that we love to talk about. I mean, we, we like talking about emotional triangles, but it's more fun when we have some sort of situation. and We love the applications. Mm-hmm. Oh, most definitely. So if you could email, it would be fantastic. Um, also, catch, catch us up on uh, YouTube and Facebook and Simplecast. You can download from there. Yeah, and then a shout out to the producer of our musical intro slash outro, Jesse Huffstetler. Uh, you can find him on Spotify at under Jetler. And uh, what are we using by him again, John? We're using the Spider Mix. <laughs> yes, yes, the the Rainbow Limiter. Charlotte, Charlotte's Starfish Web limi- is Star- yeah. basically just one big tri- interlocking mm-hmm. triangles. <laughs> Yep. So thanks to Jesse for his starfish limiter. And uh, that's going to wrap it up. That is definitely going to wrap us up. So with that, I am Alex. I'm Jed. And I'm Zach. Oh, wait, Ed. Who's Ed? Ed. <laughs> that's where I'm going to go next. I'm going to bed. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> oh.